Welcome back, everyone. Our moderator for the final session is Doretha Williams Flournoy. Doretha is the Chief Operating Officer for the California Institute for Mental Health. She has over 25 years of experience implementing community-based mental health and health care services, program planning and administration, and public policy. Her portfolio includes the provision of statewide technical assistance and training programs focused on prevention and early intervention, reducing disparities in integration of primary care and behavioral health. Welcome, Doretha, and I'd like to welcome back all of our presenters from today. Thank you. Well, I too would like to welcome you back after having had your break there. And um, I want to start by um, acknowledging Karen Korosaki and her team for organizing this wonderful day of, of stimulating conversation, thought-provoking emotions. I mean, I, I was going through all kind of changes back there <laughs> in the back. And I just, I, I, I really have enjoyed the, the, the unique opportunity to have folks like you in the room. And so if you agree with me, why don't we give them a, an applause to After they do their work, they don't get much love. They're <laughs> off to the next project. So you need to love up on them and let them know that you appreciate this. The other thing I'd like to do is, and please, if I get, get, get pronounce your name wrong, just forgive me already. Ma'atisak? Ma Ma'atisak? Ma yes. Yes. Go ahead, girl. <laughs> Good job. Good job. And I want to say that I am honored to be in the presence of folks of your stature and, and your experience and your power. I really appreciate your willingness to take a day out of your life to come and share with us and, and to sort of think through with us what the next steps could be. Dr. Cross, I can't help but just tell you that um, I'm like 53 years old, soon to be 54, and when I went to college in the very beginning, <laughs> I was reading your stuff. I'm, I'm like the Subaru commercial. <laughs> and, he's, and he's still alive. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. How powerful it is to be at this phase in my I, life I and true. to see you There's again. Several of us thought about this. We'd like all the white folks in the room to stand up. <laughs> No, we, we want you to stand up, because we want to thank you for being here. Come on. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes. I love it. Thank you. <laughs> because we can't do this alone, right? None of us can do this alone. We're all connected in some way or another to each other. And so as I was sitting in the back listening throughout the day, this, I um, was in a, a meeting earlier this week, and Anthony Eiten, who is the CEO of the endowment, oh, well, the president? CEO, OK, thank you, of the endowment, the California endowment, said, started talking about this thing called collective impact. I'm sorry, I don't know a cross-sectionality of um, intentionality. And he was talking about how we, we at, in this particular meeting, they were talking about how to sort of move the agenda of health equity and, and reducing disparities and how to improve the overall health outcomes for underserved, unserved populations. And they were talking about how complicated it is to make these kinds of changes when you only have one lens through which you see the problem. Mm -hmm. And that there, it ne there needed to be some way to create what we call these, this collective impact, the, the convening of people from different ideologies and, and, and experience and, and financial um, considerations and bringing all those people to the table, and, and that's not just the end of the list, youth folk, you know, people who have lived experience, bringing all of these different types of people to the table to address one issue, because when we all come together, we can all be very powerful together, 
right? <laughs> when we try to peel off each other, then that's when we lose our impact, right? So the question for you all tonight, today, this afternoon, is where do we go from here? We have a cross-section of people here in this room, experts, people who have been studying this and living it and working with folks and helping them change. You, I've been talking to some of you in the audience, and I know some of you work for the counties, and some of you work for the health departments, and some of you work in, um, in community-based organizations, and some of you also have lived experience. How can we come together to make a change? I heard um, prevention being talked about. I heard issues around multi-generational impact of things like trauma. I think that there's multi-generational impact of incarcer incarceration. In my own family, I know my nephew, you know, I, was, I drove my nephew to, um, to, to, to he, he needed a ride across town. And I, I, I said, oh, I'll give you a ride. And I know that this kid has had problems since he was like 11 years old. He had been in the system. He'd been in juvenile hall since he was 11 years old, and he was now 30, 30 something. And he had just gotten out. And he didn't know what I did, but he started telling me how he was in this AB 109 program. <laughs> and how happy he was, because he was finally getting some help, and that he was going to stay on his medications. That's my nephew. And I just happened to know that his daddy had problems. And I happened to know that this nephew has some kids who are struggling and having some challenges. So, you know, so I understand that there's some, from, a, from my own personal social location in this, I understand that there are implications cross-generationally in all of this. I heard some conversations around intervention. People who are able to sit with someone who's right there in front of them, who's living in this condition right now, and make an, make an immediate impact on the individual in front of them. I've heard folks talk about the reintegration process, those people who are in the chain, in the loop of making the decisions about how these things roll out, how people, who gets released, who doesn't get released, what services they get, what services they don't get. So we have the opportunity to create some kind of collective impact. So are we going to engage in this conversation today? Are you going to join me in this conversation today? Yes. Yes? All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn around and look at you and say, you know you told me. <laughs> All right, great. And then the final thing that I heard about was life. How powerful it was to hear you talking about what the next steps could be, and that people are surviving, and that people are living, and people are changing, and they are empowered, and they're getting better. I mean, what a powerful thing it is. And I know all of us are in this room because we're called in some way to do that work, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. So Karen did tell me that I had some questions that I needed to make sure we <laughs> talked about. And so I'm going to go over those questions, and then I'm going to allow you to start with the reflections, and then we'll turn, over, turn it over to you and ask you to give some reflections and some comments and some questions, and we're going to create a conversation back and forth, OK? And don't worry, I'm accustomed to people getting a little out of control. In my family, when we start talking about something that's powerful and that's soul stirring and that's important, everybody starts talking at the same time. <laughs> and it gets loud and sometimes it gets a little emotional. But we can handle that, all right? So don't worry. We'll be all right. Are you part Brazilian? Okay? Yes? Are you part Brazilian? Hey. <laughs> My next stop in life. <laughs> so, so we're going to talk about where you think we need to go from here. What should our agenda be? I, I understand that there's some policy agendas that are out there that are looming. Maybe we can talk about a little bit of that. What is your vision from where we go from here? What do we need to do to move us forward in this agenda? Who should be involved in the work? Who's missing from the table? How can we, who are in this room right now, move this agenda forward? How can we participate together? How can we join forces? Where are there existing opportunities to participate or form collaborations? So I'm going to start there. And who wants to go first? Go right ahead. OK, I'm sorry. Terry. I'll take a stab at it. I'm very ahead. honored to be in this group, including the presenters. Um, a lot we've said in common, which is acknowledgment is important. People, human beings exist. 
And we have the tendency in society to, to call certain human beings non-beings, to disappear them. I think we need to be beware of closets and dungeons where things go on in secret. Because when you have closets and dungeons, and I would say the solitary confinement units in our prisons are such a place, then awful things happen there and nobody knows about it. So you have to make it public in order to prevent the abuse, because abusers crave secrecy. But there's another reason to make it public, and that is that the public cuts the people who are dwelling in these places out of mind. Nobody thinks of them, and that's what we were all talking today about disappearing. So in terms of a vision for the future, I think what we have to do is make everybody come to the table. And if we want to help people who get out of prison, that is, ex-prisoners, to make it in the community, then we have to not forget the prisoners while they're behind bars. And so I think we have to make very public what's going on behind bars, some of the atrocities that are going on there, the crowding, the sexual abuse, the lack of mental health care. In the international community, to have someone with a mental health need that's not addressed with treatment is part of torture. Hmm. And that's what's going on in our jails and prisons. And we have to make that public, and we have to discuss it. So for instance, I'm a psychiatrist, so I'll mention it in terms of mental illness, but it has to do with every part of the population. If we're going to talk about mental illness, we can't talk about it without including the people who are inside the jails and the prisons. They're part of the people affected by mental illness. We have to make them all part of the discussion. We have to stop the secrecy, and that will help to prevent the disappearing. I'll, I'll, I'll follow that and say that we need to stop making people prisoners of their past. Huh. Um, and I yeah, think, that's okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and one example would be, to make it this kind of funny, um, uh, you know, the, two, three years ago I went to Brazil, and unfortunately Brazilian men is still wear Speedo when they go to the beach. <laughs> and I had, I had a purple, I swear to you, I had a purple Speedo. And someone took, a, <laughs> someone took a picture of me with the purple Speedo with the big belly hanging out, and they posted on Facebook. <laughs> so I get back to the United States, I see that picture, and I go outside with my kids and take a bunch of pictures of me looking sexy, showing my tattoos, playing basketball, and I post 20 of those pictures, <laughs> hoping that the fat Marcelo with Speedo would disappear in the bottom. <laughs> I wake up next day, Guess the top picture on my Facebook feed. Fat Marcelo with the Speedo. <laughs> Why? Because all my friends go in, they like it, they make comments, you fat bastard, and they, <laughs> and they tag me, and you know. That's, that's pretty much what a mental health chart is. Is our story about the other people. We just focus on, you know, uh, you set your mom's kitchen on fire when you were five. <laughs> Uh, you know, you, you were, what do you call when you pee on your bed? The bad, what? bad weather. You were bad weather into the whatever. You know, what crimes, you know, when men and women come out of prison and we enroll in them in our program, many providers would say, I would not enroll this person without their, their criminal records. Mm -hmm. And we said, just give, just give us their nickname and their cell phone number. And when they come over or we go to them, we just say, what are we in for, brother? And let them tell us the story. You know, I, and I made the mistake for many years as a psychologist, when I would go and assess people, I would go and read the chart first. Mm -hmm. And I will look at the diagnosis mm -hmm. and look at all the problems. Mm -hmm. and then when I sat with the person, I already got off the ground in my head. Mm -hmm. What's your problem? You know, what are you gonna have to work on? You know, I had no space. I give them no space to build their own history. So, and some of us were born with the history already written for us. And even before we were born, your story is already written for you. Our job is to let you write your own story. I'd like to piggyback off what he said. Uh, I think America has lost one of the necessary ingredients in baking that cake. You know, we're all ingredients. And if you leave out that sugar, you got a biscuit. <laughs> I, and I think that ingredient is love. Love for human beings. It's missing. And that's why a person can go to prison and not have a family visit him and, and get out and he can't get a job. Uh, uh, the person can't, get, can't vote, can't be introduced back into society. 
it doesn't even make sense that you would put a person in prison and then release a person with the same prison mentality. I mean, the, the biggest prison is the one in your head, and I think most people in America are lost in that. Mm -hmm. You know, as far as I'm concerned, I think it's denial. Hmm. I ask my wife all the time, we have these conversations. When you see a homeless person on the street, and you go home, and you eat, and you play with your kids, and you go to bed, and not one time did you have a thought for that homeless person you saw on the street, something's wrong with you. And so I'm challenging you. What type of mentality could see a person suffering, mumbling to himself, drugged out, shirt off, women, go home and act as if nothing has happened? For me, when I see that person, they have to force me not to stop. The least I can do is give my card and say, hey, let me pray with you. Let me help you. Do you need something to eat? So I see a complete disconnect from what I'm seeing. That's what I think America is lacking in love. And I, and I think it's fear-based. It's fear-based. Like, I told my story, and a lot of people probably are afraid. And I'm okay with that, but I understand that. So for me, it's having compassion on every living being. And I'm gonna end with this. If you can get upset at a man for hurting a dog, and you get a nationwide outcry, then why aren't you so upset that you're not on your cell phone right now texting all of this to Facebook and all the social medias and getting really upset? Because the information that's been presented is not new information, and it's not hidden. So that's my take. Yeah, that, that's very powerful, very powerful. I, I think on some level you're right that, that we are afraid. We are afraid. I think on some level, you know, as, as a young therapist, I remember people used to um, worry about whether or not they were working with somebody who had an addictions problem or who had been in jail because they had these personality issues and, and the young therapist was likely to be wooed in or played in some way or give privileges when they're not supposed to and all of those things. And so you've, you've been taught to you know, tread lightly and to not get engaged or not to connect with people, you to maintain some level of distance. Am I right about that? I don't know, but yes, yeah. And so it's always a challenge. It's always a challenge to maintain the appropriate boundaries, but to also be a, a, available to help and to serve. So, yes. Yeah, sort of along the same lines about making sure we get all the ingredients. I really want to uh, acknowledge and thank Dr. Cross for having our white brothers and sisters a moment ago stand up. The question that has stayed with me throughout the day, someone in the audience asked, how are we going to get rid of racism? How are we going to change this system? I am tremendously honored to be here today and to be having this discussion, but part of what I grapple with is I feel like I'm preaching to the choir. Yes. We all are aware of this, we all know this, we're all passionate about it, and we need that. We need that because there's people whose lives are depending on our ability to help them, so that's great. We will not be able to affect change unless we get the buy-in from our white brothers and sisters and our colleagues. They are a critical, important, they're a critical piece of this puzzle. The issue of power and privilege was discussed earlier. There is a question that was posed to me in graduate school that I, today haunts me, actually. It, and I use that word intentionally. It haunts me, because I don't know the answer to it. My mentor, Dr. Robert Carter, had his students write a paper about talk about racism, an aspect of racism. And he said, I want you to offer a solution for racism. I'm like, OK. He's like, given that historically, statistically, we can see that white folks have been in positions of power, any evidence of that? How many non-white presidents have we had? How many, what's the percentage of CEO folks, the, the racial makeup of CEO folks? And I can go on and on. How would white folks benefit from giving or sharing their power with us? What's in it for them? 
without using moral arguments. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because mm -hmm. people have been making moral arguments about how wrong racism is for years, and they have fallen on deaf ears. Yes. It's, we've made a lot of progress, but it's taken a lot of sacrifice and a lot of pain for us to get to this point. And so that's a question that I'm, I'm wanting to leave with all of you. How can I have call, discussions and conversations with my white allies, with the people that are, uh, have the ability to make change in terms of policy? What's in it for them? Mm -hmm. And I don't know that it's an easy, easy answer, but I do recognize that our white brothers and sisters are also victims of racism. It is not healthy, psychologically healthy, to inherit the role of the oppressor. Right. I don't think white people wake up and be like, I want to be an oppressor. <laughs> I want to be racist. I don't believe that. I've, ne I've been fortunate enough never to have come across a white person that had that belief. Maybe they exist. I'm sure they do. But it impacts them as well. And while I believe that, it, it does on an emotional level, I think in order for us to really foster true change, we have to make an argument for why it affects them economically in every which way. The business case for, mm -hmm. um, for equity. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. can, I, can I actually jump yes. in on that? Which is, I mean, I think, well, first I want to thank everybody who's in this room for all the work that you do. Um, um, it's incredibly important, uh, and, it's, and it's incredibly uh, important to me that this room is full, actually. Um, five years ago, this room wouldn't have been full, um, not, not because of AB, because AB 109 didn't exist then, but um, these issues weren't, weren't as um, public. Um, and, and so I guess the, the issue I want to just raise, and not to be a cynic, or, is that AB 109 didn't happen because we had some moral shift. That's right. AB 109 happened because uh, there was overcrowding and there are fiscal concerns, and, um, and so that's why there is AB 109. And so I think it's really important as we think about how it is to change the conversation to think about what are the factors that have changed the conversation and what, are, what people are receptive to um, in terms of um, changing the dialogue, changing policy, changing practice. Um, I think there's been a lot of great, uh, great ideas here about meeting people where they're at. Um, and um, from a policy uh, perspective, uh, from where I sit, um, I, I, I guess I, it's, the historical parallels are really important to me. Um, we, we, uh, we didn't have um, the Constitution because academics or policymakers thought we should. Um, we didn't uh, get rid of slavery because academics or policymakers thought we should. We didn't uh, have the Social Security Act because academics or policymakers said we should. Uh, we didn't have the Great Society programs because academics or policymakers said we should. Um, these are all times in American history where people have, people have stood up and said, this isn't the way things should be, and we need to change it. And, um, and so I guess that my, my thought is that um, armed with the knowledge that we have, much of which isn't new, um, but in the environment in which we now live, I think there are people who, myself included, who need to make a case and who need to let our legislators know, need to let other people know, need to let our friends, family members know that these are really important issues. And so I think that's, to pay attention to that, um, I often say as an educator, I can't teach people things they don't want to know. So the question that I think about is how can I frame some of these issues in the context that people can understand? Much like as you know, a mental health professional, meeting people where they're at. Same thing with my family members and my friends, meeting them where they're at um, to make the case for change. So changing the narrative so that the other person who's, who may want to get engaged has a reason for right. stepping to the table and staying at the table yes. to see the change through. Mm -hmm. Certainly making a business case for why we need to do it. But it sounds like we also need to do some self-introspection, right? Some yeah. introspective work on where we are in relation to the subject matter and the people who are mm -hmm. impacted by it. Without which nothing will change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You are morally responsible for the truth that you see. And if it means nothing to you, then it means nothing to you. It's certainly the power that holds us at the table. Dr. Cross. We need a <coughs> statewide 
George Jackson Society, <laughs> in which we somehow connect uh, former prisoners to come together and create their own society, an advocacy group. And they need a web page. We, we, we saw where the gays and lesbians created It Gets Better. And they actually post uh, many speeches and talks so that someone who is feeling isolated can, and if they're close to a computer, they can turn it on, and maybe they hear a speech by Jimmy. And that should be totally controlled by, by the folk themselves. Now, th that's a direct thing that we need. These are several indirect things. You need to support within the state, I don't think you have it yet, uh, universal preschool education of high quality for everyone. The research tends to show that even in the case of low-income kids, marginalized kids, that if they receive high-quality pre-K, they're better prepared to negotiate the junk that happens after that. And then you need to figure out a way to, as individual citizens, to get your state to support large-scale infrastructure projects where there's an HR policy that uh, 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 makes sure that um, people who are, who are co coming out of prison have a decent shot at some of the jobs that are created. I mean large-scale projects. Mm -hmm. Because the thing that feeds the issue that we're talking about is really not personality. It's not even a sense of spirituality. It's the absence of, absence of employment. You can see it in the kids in high school. They, they don't see where they, where they belong because they don't see where their adults belong. And any time a child is surrounded by adults who are unemployed, that's, the, that's a huge message being sent to them that the society doesn't care. Yes, yes. And if you think about it, why are we going through so many changes now and we didn't uh, earlier? I grew up in the 50s. It was almost the golden age of African-American uh, labor. Uh, everybody and his mother was employed, the industries were bursting at the seams, and it's probably one of the, the lowest points of crime uh, in Chicago and, and in Detroit and in New York and so on. About 1965, the society began to move away from heavy industry. And Troy Duster, Troy Duster, has done an analysis to show that as the opportunity structure for uh, less educated, low-income people goes down, incarceration rates go up. Hmm. It is the solution to redundant workers. The hip-hop generation is the generation after this long-term employment, and then the kids didn't tolerate it, and they began to speak out. Uh, but as citizens, you need to find a way to support people who will argue for projects that might take 10 or 15 years, such as revamping our sanitation uh, systems, having micro uh, fi fiberglass connections throughout the state, rebuilding of schools, uh, making sure every bridge is, is in super shape. All these things can require bourgeois people, architects and designers, but they also employ, employ people where they're at because that's our biggest problem right now. We're not employing a large number of people where they are at. Not with retraining, not with getting a master's degree, where they are at. And when this was done in the 30s, uh, with the building of the Hoover Dam and so on, uh, we showed that we could move scores of people from the lowest rung of society to a more comfortable point in society. And that can only be done by some sort of large-scale series of collective uh, big digs uh, throughout California, Nevada, New York, and so on. So those are my initial thoughts. Yes, yes, yes. Some of them tangential to our agenda, some of them directly. No, just, well, just about a quick thing with what you said. Um, I moved to California 23 years ago. 23 years ago, I moved to this state. In the last 23 years, guess how many prisons got built? Hmm. 23. Huh. Maybe they saw I'm coming, like, here comes the Brazilians, let's build some, <laughs> let's build some prisons. Uh, how many colleges got built in 23 years? One. One. Wow. One. Forty-five thousand dollars to keep a man in prison. Fifteen thousand dollars for a UC system, which to me is like expensive. Come on, that's public. 
But so just like you said, you know, we are we are, and, and why? Why do you think that? Because the the for-profit prison are one of the biggest lobbyists for Democrats and Republicans. That's why. You know, maybe I joke that uh, <clears throat> we started war on drugs and now people use more drugs than ever. Maybe we should start a war in education. Maybe we should convince the prison industrial complex that there's something, maybe we should create some performance outcomes for them and then they get compensated <laughs> based on outcomes right. for the folks who yeah. they've incarcerated yeah. over a period of yeah, time. Yeah. We can see some outcomes. <coughs> maybe that or, would change the focus a how, little bit. And <laughs> how about, how about fully funded schools? And have prisons survive on box tops or tops box, this thing that you're trying to do. <laughs> I'm going to open it up to you. Go ahead, Terry. I, I just want to say something about, first of all, all of us here. I, I feel a lot like I'm preaching to the choir. I think everybody here gets everything up, everyone up here is saying. The work is very difficult. I, I want to make a radical proposal, and that is that the work we all do is heroic. And the reason it's heroic is this, is society is intent on forgetting the people we're trying to serve. Mm -hmm. That is, they've disappeared them behind bars. When they get out of prison, society doesn't care, doesn't supply services. And so to fight against the stream in that sense is heroic. What I think goes on in public service is that to the extent society demeans and diminishes the value of the disadvantaged people among us, the job of helping those people is demeaned and diminished as well, and the result is burnout. And I think the solution to burnout is to look upon ourselves as heroic. That is, we're bucking a tide here. Society is trying to forget the people that we're trying to help. That's how racism works. That's how criminal justice, the prison industrial complex works. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're bucking that. And I think we have to look at that in its social context so that when they reduce our salary, when they uh, defund our programs, we understand that we're working against something that's very powerful. And to do that work is heroic. And I think we need to talk to each other in that way and get support from each other. Awesome. Thank you. Comments, questions, reflections? Someone coming. Come on. Get to the microphones. Get in line. Don't worry about it, because we, we need to, we only have about 30 minutes left to have this unique opportunity to count, converse in this way. Go ahead. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Michelle Speed. And I am actually a vice principal yeah. at one of the local um, school districts in the area. And I have the children. I work with the children of the people that we're talking about today. And I wanted to be here because I wanted to kind of help stop that cycle. I see in my students, and I work at the high school level, and almost by that time, all of those habits are already in, in place, unfortunately. Um, kids are coming to me already addicts, um, self-medicating. It's the only way they can get through the day. And I've learned so much today. And my question is, how can I go back and kind of package this for my staff? Um, right now, there's a lot of um, the legislation is changing, and kind of the message for us this year is to no longer suspend students. Um, we're called a, a C school now because there is a disproportionality of African American and Latino students who are being suspended, as well as being um, labeled special ed. Mm -hmm. And so, again, that, that cycle what, that I was talking about. So now we have the disruptions in the classroom and things like that. But these students that we're talking about, their parents are incarcerated. Um, they have not been, for a large uh, portion of their life, have not been there to provide stability. So I've heard so many good things, but I'm trying to think of an um, efficient way to kind of package it, because the morale right now at my school is very, very low, because no one knows what to do. We've been given staff. We have now a mental health specialist on staff. We have a school psychologist, but my question, are they used to 
dealing in the, or uh, working in the, in, at the school level. So based on your experience, how can I package this to my staff? Can I, can I, can I stop you for one second? Yes. Tell me again what county you're in? In the Sacramento County. Sacramento County. How many of you work for Sacramento County Mental Health or AOD? Stand up, please, if you do. Okay, so of those of you who are standing, how many of you have at least maybe one answer to some of the questions that she has? Raise your hand if you have at least one, que one answer to the questions that she's asking. Come on, Contreras, I, I see your hand. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. All right, very good. So we're gonna make sure that you all talk to each other because that's a local answer right there, okay. all right? But, I appreciate but, that. Our, I, I would uh, dare to uh, try to put together, let's start out with a small group, small group of parents. You can kind of pick and choose who uh, probably are gonna be interested and you're doing something. And then I, would, I wouldn't have you do it. I'd have them design the study, in which they are going to go out and interview parents and ask them, you know, what do we need to do? And then package that in the, you're, you, you know how to do the language. Help them pa package that report and then go to your board. Make it, make it organic. Mm -hmm. uh, make, make it so that their fingerprints are all over the place. It may take you a while to get them started, but they'll, they'll know that there's a need, and you may have to be the trigger, but you want to go as fast as you can so it goes from, from your head, from your heart, from your bosom, into theirs. Uh, and in a sense, ask them to ask themselves what is missing, what needs to be done, and if they had a chance to present some sort of report to your school board, you know, what kind of report would it be like? And they call this participatory action research. Right, right. And uh, you probably can find someone at a local college mm -hmm. who can assist you in that. So participatory action research. And what's cool about this is that you literally train the yeah. parents yeah. to do the interviews. You train the parents to do the analysis. You train the parents to give voice to their results. And you train the parents to make the presentations. And then in a sense, you're almost creating a mini social movement. Very good. Yes. Um, Damian King, <clears throat> Rubicon Programs. Um, one of the things I believe, like, this population, particularly communities, communities of color, are, are suffering from is uh, information famine. Here we all are taking a proactive approach to, to talk about this population, how we can better serve this population. Yet at the same time, uh, when we engage this population, we're not, gauge, we're not engaging them from a perspective of educating them about the structural or the cultural dynamics that create the conditions that they're trying to come out of or that we want them to come out of. So here we are with this kind of elitist, narcissistic attitude, like, I have this service, take it, it's going to help you, it's going to make you better. Then on the, on, at the other end of the spectrum, when they go home, when they leave our programs, when they go back to the projects, when they go back to the hoods, um, they don't even understand how they got here. They don't even understand how they got into their gated community, where the history of our projects and different things like that. And I'm a, I'm a firm believer, being someone who is uh, formerly incarcerated, um, being a service provider, I'm a publisher of a magazine, Redeem World magazine, knowing that, um, that there is an information famine that exists hmm. and how do we address that and do you all have any strategies or, or ideas about that? One strategy of engagement I'll share with you. Uh, I used to work with the homeless in Long Beach, and there was this woman who uh, was living by a, a, on, a, on, a, on a bus bench. Uh, she was drinking vodka every day. She had maggots coming out of her leg. Uh, and many, many providers had come to her with an agenda. We want to get you house. We want to get you health. We want to get you, you know, treatment. And she pretty much gave them the finger every time. Uh, me and my buddy show up one day, and she thought we were going to ask the same, you know, have the same agenda. I went to her and I said, I don't know, she was drinking, maybe she thought this was a dream, but I said, uh, imagine if I was a genie coming out of a bottle, and you had one wish, what would you want? And she looked at me and she said, a new shopping cart. Hmm. So me and my buddy went, and we bought her a shopping cart. And we brought it to her. And we put her there. She looked at me like, whoa, she couldn't believe. And I said, here it is. See you next week. 
that was the first time that women engaged with someone. I think we need to ask people, what do you want? Where do you want to go? And then what can help you to get there? But if we go with our agenda, we need you to get treatment. You need to stop using drugs. You need to get housed. You need to take care of this illness, you know? That's your agenda. That's for your numbers, for your boss, you know, say they're doing a good job. That's not necessarily what people want. Jamal, can you introduce yourself to while you're at it? Okay. And I, uh, my name is Jamal Miller. Um, I was appointed last year by Governor Brown to be the deputy director over the state's Office of Health Equity. I'm glad for the invitation um, to be here. Uh, the focus of our office um, is to achieve, uh, to work um, within political realms, within government, to work to achieve health and mental health um, equity in the state of California. And I've been uh, in the position since October 1. And I've probably had more than 200 or some odd meet and greets um, with key stakeholders across the state within this particular community, from the grass tops to the grassroots. And one of the common threads that I've seen is that we have multiple agendas and issues that we're trying to prioritize. And that's the challenge of being kind of this circus act of juggling multiple issues so I am really challenged with harnessing the talent that we have within our office and this tight window of time that we have to make our office relevant, to really focus in on what are the social determinants of health that really allow us to get at many of these persistent health and mental health disparities, particularly that disproportionately impact this vulnerable group that we're talking about today. And to ditto what the professor talked about earlier, Race and ethnicity is absolutely key, but when you look at the role of income and when you look at the role of education, um, those are the two kind of cross-cutting transcendent indicators with respect to social determinants of health that if we focus like lasers in on those two particular issues, we have the greatest opportunity within a relatively short period of time to literally re-engineer many of the dynamics that we're talking about one of the priorities within our Office of Health Equity is to shift our focus from managing symptoms and to go upstream and really to challenge the social inequities that often um, we don't dive deeply into to address. Because when we're talking about reengineering institutions, we're talking about, okay, what's the composition demographically of the legislature at the, at the, the federal level, at the state level, What's the composition of major corporate institutions, those who mobilize and influence resources? Many of those individuals, what, don't look like us. Hmm. And sometimes we act surprised when we see the outcomes that um, we have to grapple with. So it's just an observation. So the reality of uh, what, I'm, what I'm getting at is ultimately how do we develop this pipeline for this marathon that we're embarking upon? And that's investing into our children with respect to education, because I look at the three E's, the role of education, exposure, and experience. These children can't become what they necessarily haven't seen. And if we invest heavily into our children, prioritize income and education, that's gonna give us a, a rich, rich opportunity to really combat many of these issues that we're talking about today. Lastly, two examples I wanna give of what we're focused on in the Office of Health Equity to try and transform and re-engineer institutions is our California Reducing Disparities Project. It's a $60 million project that's funded out of the Mental Health Services Act to invest specifically, for the first time in our country, it's a project of this magnitude to address mental health disparities across five particular population cohorts. Um, LGBTQQI, um, African American, Latino, Native American, and API. And one of the, we're issuing the, um, the RFP this summer, the request for proposals this summer, um, with the intent of securing about 20 to 30 contracts and awardees to invest in community-defined evidence. And the biggest piece that we often lack that we're gonna invest in is the, evalu the rigorous evaluation to demonstrate that these community-defined, culturally and linguistically appropriate services work because too many times our organizations come to the door <laughs> like this. <laughs> and when we get the money, which is so much needed, 
we rarely come back to the table and say, you know what, this is what we did with that 60 million. So let's double up next time and get 120 and invest more into what I call the losers, which aren't losers, but I say the losers with respect to those organizations who often do not get the resources because the usual suspects have the resources and they monopolize, but that's another story. So there are key stakeholders in the room that who know me. I have a meeting with the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco like now to go upstream on this stuff we're talking about, so I'm gonna have to leave. But the last emerging practice I wanna share with you about going upstream is our Health and All Policies Task Force and our team that is housed out of the Office of Health Equity. This is getting our government systems, agencies, departments, and offices to embed a mental health, a health equity, and a health lens into all policies and decisions that they make. So the Department of Education is at the table, Cal EPA, um, the Office of Planning and Research, uh, the Department of Food and Ag Housing, many of the non-medical, non-health entities, we have them at the table. Is the and Department we, of Corrections at the table? And we have their ears, and the Department of Corrections is at the table. And the unique opportunity we have with the Department of Correction, and, I'll, and the link is you'll get, is around their food procurement practices. Many of the incarcerated that they release are unhealthier physically than when they initially presented. And a lot of that has to do with the government is a, it, the, the, the corrections department is a huge purchaser of food. Much of the food that is being ingested and digested by those who are incarcerated is high in sodium and high in fat. So there's a fiscal opportunity with how we procure these contracts to buy the food that we're feeding these, um, these individuals, but also it has mental and physical health implications on them. So when you talk about going upstream, it seems on the surface to have nothing to do with mental health and physical health, but has everything to do with it. So we're in government, we're looking at a cross-sectoral collective impact approach to re-engineering institutions. We have our work cut out for us. It's not just government. It, it takes all of us to do it, and I can't, our office can't succeed without any of you. So I just wanted to share that with you. I went long-winded, I'm sorry, but I needed to, to get that out to, to, to show that we are committed to partnering alongside with you all to get at really a lot of these issues. It's not gonna be easy. The, the issues are very real, but I'm very, very optimistic. That's what keeps me motivated. So I'll leave it Thank there. You. I'll leave Thank you. It. Thank you. Before, before you go, before you go. I'd like to make a request to the cameraman. Can you cut the part that I said that for-profit prison give money to them? <laughs> <laughs> I'll give a video of me on a speedo instead of so you to put it. <laughs> and I have to say, there's, people good, there's good people in both sides. You know, like Representative uh, Johnny Mitchell, for example, uh, uh, in, uh, in LA. Uh, you know, there's this, you guys know about the crack versus powder cocaine, you know, like uh, it used to be 100 to 1. Uh, President Obama moved to 18 to 1. It should be 1 to 1. You know? So there's. My comment is just that you know there's there's good people in the government, there's good people in in both sides of the spectrum uh, helping us out. So it's not I didn't want to make like a <laughs> bad Jerry Brown. You know. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Dwayne McShan. Oh, one of the least, what some people might say the least, but I'm getting just my thought. Mm. Huh? Well, I think. We keep looking for someone else to give us the answer. And you already have the answer, which is you. Hmm. One person, Mandela, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Magadi, name them. You take one person, like my brother from another mother said, how can you drive by and see a person sleeping on the streets and it does not, and your pocket's full? full or more than you need some of us and you don't have no remorse to give help them in any way that you can but yet though we say we love God I don't think he gonna buy that I think he gonna be like depart from me you of nicotine because who <laughs> I'm you you me mm -mm. hallelujah <laughs> I'm getting to anyway we must, it's easy to stop. You stop it, you raise a child in the way it should go. It might falter a little bit, but don't wait. I'm not going to say God can help anybody, my God. Don't, child going to school, you can drive by yourself 
when children are going to school, which I do, and you can see the ones that need help. It's cold, don't have no coat. But do we think to buy them a coat? Or, <laughs> or that, that they're not, hair is not combed. Me, myself, God's gonna hold you account, accountable for your deed. You cannot get paid on earth in heaven too. Which one? Which one? This ain't gonna do me no good. I'm not saying be broke, but what you do to the least of mine, you have done unto me. And that means whoever, 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 no, whoever. And I, I pass it. I'm through. <laughs> well done. Well done. Thank you. Last comment, but you know what I want to ask you is who's missing? If we were to do this again, if we were to have this conversation again, who's missing? And so I just thank, I see your hands. And so as soon as he finishes, Karen, can I just get that question going? And okay, so as soon as he's finished, I just want you to stand up and tell me, okay? Because we're going to do that really fast. Otherwise, I'm going to get in trouble for running over time. I think I'm already in trouble. I'll try to be real brief. I'm Steve Lewis. I'm a chief assistant uh, public defender in Sacramento County. I'm here with my boss, Plano Duran, the public defender. So I've got to be careful about what I say here. Um, <laughs> but I want to echo some of the comments on or pick up on the top uh, what Professor Pettit said about realignment in California isn't all about a moral change or, or thought process on the part of people in terms of. Um, releasing people from prison. It's about the prison law office that filed a lawsuit years ago against the Department of Corrections for overcrowding, forcing the federal court to get involved and make an order to reduce population. And then part of reducing that population was AB 109 and realignment. And so I don't mean to be cynical because I'm trying to be very optimistic here because I've been uh, a lawyer in the public defender's office for 26 years, Paulino longer. This is the first time in our careers where we have ever seen a movement away from incarceration. We have a unique opportunity in each county because we're all implementing uh, realignment in each of our counties. I oversee our mental health court, our, our drug court, and now we have a new realignment court, a reentry court um, in Sacramento that started July 1st. We're taking um, in, uh, clients that would otherwise go to county jail prison and bringing them into the community and trying to provide them with services, housing, mental health, substance abuse, job connection. And the question was asked, well, what can we do to try to, try to uh, help in this effort? And I think it's really important that you work at a local level to try to help this population coming out of the county jail prisons and the state prisons to succeed in our communities because the moment recidivism doesn't go down, the moment one of these clients or a couple of these clients get out into the community and commit a horrific crime, and you couple that with the economy in California improving, what you're going to see is a return to incarceration in the prison industry, building of more prisons, um, the Correctional Peace Officers Association regaining their hold on, uh, on, on state government. So I would urge you all to get involved at a local level in your county and, and help these people get jobs, help them succeed. Thank you. I almost said that you were missing from the table. <laughs> Thank you. I saw hands go up about who's missing. So who's missing? Some juvenile hall staff I think would be good. We could have juvenile hall staff here. Juvenile hall staff. Formerly, in, formerly incarcerated clients. Thank you. I saw hands back there. Yes. Probation and CDCR. Probation and CDCR. Who else? Ah, probation, CDCR. Stand up. Wave your hands. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Very good. Yes. I'd love to hear more about incarcerated women. Incarcerated women. Very good. Child welfare. Child welfare. Very good. Children of incarcerated parents. Yes. Employers that will hire. Yes. Right. Employers that will hire. Yeah. Or employers who have an investment in making sure that people stay out of the jail system, right? Oh, Amen. Yes? Yes. Very good. OK. Yes. A legal team that will help change the policy within the prison. 
A legal team that will help change the policies within the prisons. Good. Yes. Hey. <laughs> they, do, they do influence how we think about all of this, right? Yes. The people were, yes. They should be here. I mean, because lived experience is, 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 I don't know if it's statistics, but it, it's going now. Mentoring. And you need those people to speak for themselves. Like yes. Me. We need to ask them what they want. Right. Or just hear their voice. Yes. And, you know, I heard a lot up here about support. Everybody have a, a dream or a, a dream. But Sometimes it's dead, yes. but if you support them, you yes. say, yeah, your dream can come true. How can I support you to make your dream come true? Mm -hmm. yes. And that's why mentoring is so, so good today. Everybody mentoring. Why? Because it works. Hey, mentors, dreamers, people who can motivate, the people who are living with, live, who are living with, yes. Educators at all. Educators at all levels. I heard earlier a conversation about trauma. I think we need some trauma-informed folks in the room who could talk to us a little bit about how to get ahead of this issue. Yes, anything else? Anybody else? Univision. I'm sorry? Univision. Spanish <laughs> yes, speaking. Yes, Spanish speaking, that's right. That's right, very good. Very good, social media. Karen, I have now gone over, so <laughs> your turn. Please Thank join me in thanking Doretha Williams-Pornoy and all the presenters. <laughs>